Little Irish Poetry for William Butler Yeats. <coughs> the Lake Isle of Innisfree. <coughs> I will arise and go now, go to Innisfree, a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, and a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, noon a purple glow, evening full of linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway, on this pavement gray, I hear it in the deep heart's core. Very nice. <clears throat> Here's Plunkett. He was in the rebellion, Easter. They shot him for his pains. He died in 19. 16, Joseph Mary Plunkett. I see his blood upon the rose, and in the stars the glory of his eyes. His body gleams amid eternal snows. His tears fall from the skies. See his face in every flower. Thunder, the singing of the birds about his voice, and carved by his power rocks are his written words. All pathways by his feet are worn. His strong heart stirs the ever-beating sea. His crown of thorns is twined with every thorn. His cross is every tree. That's Plunkett. The best line is, all pathways by his feet are worn. That means yours too. He's been there. <clears throat> then there's, um, his, we sang this in the sixth grade in the Belcher School in East Milton with Ms. Howes. The, I don't, well, it's by Thomas Moore with two O's, Irish Moore. Believe me, if all those endearing young charms which I gaze on so fondly today were to change by tomorrow and fleet in my arms like fairy gifts fading away, thou wouldst still be adored as this moment thou art. Let thy loveliness fade as it will. And around a dear ruin, each wish of my heart would entwine itself burdenly still. It's not while beauty and youth are thine own, and thy cheeks unprofaned by a tear, that the fervent faith of a soul may be known, to which time will make thee more dear. No, the heart that has truly loved never forgets, truly loves on to its close. As the sunflower turns to her God when he sets, the same look which he turned when he rose. Well, Thomas Moore wrote that for his wife in the plague of smallpox. She's afraid she'd get the plague and would be, would be blemished with the pox, and then he wouldn't love her anymore. So he wrote her that. Believe me, if all those endearing young charms which I gaze on so fondly today, were to change by tomorrow and fleet in my arms, and so on. Yeah. I suppose the, the idea that they were had in mind in having sixth grade kids sing that is uh, abiding love, permanent love, you know. This, um, then there's this 538. It's about poets primarily, but I think it would include a wider range of people, priests and prophets and monks and mystics, I think would fit in the same category. We are the music makers. We are the dreamers of dreams, wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams. World losers and world forsakers on whom the pale moon gleams. Yet we are the makers and shakers of a world forever, it seems. With wonderful deathless ditties, we build up the world's great cities, and out of a fabulous story, we fashion an empire's glory. One man with a dream at pleasure shall go forth and conquer a crown, and three where the new song's measure can trample an empire down. We in the ages lying in the buried past of the earth build Nineveh with our sighing and Babel itself with our mirth. 
and o'er through them with prophesying to the old of the new world's birth, worth. For each age is a dream that is dying or one that is coming to birth. I think sometimes it's both. I think ours is like that. Each age is a dream that is dying or one that is coming to birth. <clears throat> then there's uh, one more, the Irish Patriot song. It's by the same, <clears throat> same moor, the Irish moor with two O's. <clears throat> The harp that once through Tara's halls the soul of music shed now hangs as mute on Tara's walls as if that soul were fled. So sleeps the pride of former days, so glory's thrill is o'er, and hearts that once beat high for praise now feel that pulse no more. No more the chiefs and ladies bright the harp of Tara swells, record alone that breaks at night its tale of ruin tells. Thus, freedom now so seldom wakes, the only throb she gives is when some heart indignant breaks to show that still she lives. The harp at once through Tara's Hall by Moore. Okay, here's a thought on forgiveness. Very important. We need to return to it continually. Basic to the spiritual life of anyone. We think of forgiveness in three ways forgiving God, forgiving neighbor, forgiving self. We may not be too ready to see a need to forgive God, yet it isn't likely and unlikely that there's a need for it. Hasn't anything ever happened to you that tried your faith in God? Some things in life are very difficult or impossible to understand. On the cosmic level, major calamity, war, pestilence, hunger, poverty, earthquake, tornado. We don't exactly blame God for these things, but they do arouse in the human heart a lot of wondering, why? Why is there such a colossal amount of human misery, quite apparently beyond man's control, and obviously within his. What sort of God is he? Theological explanations are all well and good, but when in the concrete we confront these horrors, the explanations seem to be rather weak and cannot curb a sense of resentment or even outrage. This isn't rare. It's small, no small thing to maintain your faith in a loving God <coughs> in the face of overwhelming facts in life. On a similar situation, we deal on a personal level. It's no much different. Smaller, but the smaller scale doesn't mean the suffering is less, for even a global disaster can only be experienced personally. We only have so much to, you know, to re react with. Why am I who I am? Why are the components gone into my life's history so poor or inadequate? In terms of body, mind, soul, size, sheep, childhood, youth, indeed my whole history, why are they what they are? Without me being aware of it, we may hide in deepest depths some resentment against God for making me as I am, my history as it is. This doesn't mean we're just a bundle of resentment although some people are, but rather some sense that may be present only now and then becoming obvious to us in some moment of insight. You know, to be the dumbest kid in the class, it's no fun. Kids can be cruel, you know. Not to be a girl and not to be pretty, no fun. To be a, gay, a boy and have no skill at athletics, at games, it's a curse. How would you like to be gay in New Haven? Wow, what a gift from God. Yeah. So it seems necessary to forgive God, humanly speaking. Well, that's the only how we're dealing with this. There's the need to face up to that <clears throat> and answer with genuine forgiveness. 
Otherwise, we're going to have a bitterness and, and it will surface sooner or later and may sour a whole lifetime. I mean, in your later years, a sour old man or old woman, bitter. The more so, we don't know why. It's possible, maybe even likely, that we may have running around in our deep some sort of umbrage at the way God has treated us, or put it on less personal levels, life has treated us. Explanations I don't think are adequate. They're not deep enough to quell a sense of fury. Forgiveness is ultimately an act of faith rooted in Christ. It's not an explanation. In the presence of something we cannot understand for the life of us, you know, which is a source of much anguish and suffering, forgiveness for Christ's sake is the only way out. And that's a superb act of love. It's no small thing to forgive God. I speak humanly. Well, this is the way we experience things down here. You know, a mother to have a child that's less than normal, you know. They take a lot of faith, you know. And I, you know more than cases like that than I do. I mean situations, you know, <clears throat> your house burns down, whatever, your kid gets run over with a truck, you know, whatever, you can go on and on. So what have I done to deserve this? So on. So I think it's something that should be faced up to and adequately answered in faith and out of love. You're figuring, well, God's will be done. It sounds corny, it sounds inadequate. Well, it may be all you can hang on to in a moment of anguish. And not pretending that it's an adequate uh, solution or a response, but it's, it works for, for the time. It's what he said on Thursday night in the garden. He saw what was coming. All the ugly and evil of the world was to be imputed to him, and he was to be struck down. No. Let this cup pass. There was no answer. No, what was his response? Thy will be done. Okay. And all paths by his feet have been trod. 